uh, if you'd like to ask a question um, and you don't have the ability for video, you may unmute and uh, speak your name and one of uh, our co-hosts will recognize you. Those who would like to put your questions in the chat, we have two young people who will be monitoring the chat, that's Jade and Nathan, and they will retrieve your questions from the chat and we will handle it like that. So those are the ground rules. Uh, we're going to have three presentations. Uh, Sister Annette is going to present uh, for about 15 minutes is her session, uh, followed by uh, Dr. Webley and then by Dr. Polonis. In, the, in each section, we will have an opportunity to ask one or two questions, but then at the end, after all three have presented, uh, we will have approximately half an hour of question and answers where you can ask any of these three presenters your questions. Uh, these presenters are, as we all know, uh, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, but they are not theologians. They don't speak for the church. They are here as public health professionals to assist us to understand about this COVID-19 uh, virus. So please bear that in mind as you address your questions. They may not be able to give you definitive answers as far as the spiritual or religious aspects are concerned, but uh, they will do their best to give us the best knowledge from a public health, uh, medical, scientific uh, background. We are we're fortunate to have our own pastor with us, Pastor Norman, and we will rely on him to give us some insight on any questions that might arise with regard to the religious um, aspect of this COVID-19. So uh, let me just, uh, as we move forward, I'd just like to start with a little bit of information here. And then the first speaker will be Sister Annette and she'll be discussing uh, the medical experience, her medical experience on the front lines. But just to remind us, we lived for nine months or so in 2020 with the COVID-19 virus. The latest information that we have tells us that over 20 million Americans have been infected by the virus, of which 348,000 have died. In our home state of Massachusetts, 375,000 cases of COVID-19 have been uh, found so far of which 12,400 people have died. And in Worcester County, to bring it home close to us, 42,595 people have tested positive for the COVID-19, of which 1,523 have died. Just to bring it home, close to us. If we take the attendance of our church at Pleasant Street and multiply it by 10, that's approximately how many people have died from this COVID virus in uh, the Worcester County alone. This is a serious issue. And so this evening, 
we're looking for serious information and answers that will help us to deal with this pandemic that we're facing. So without anything further, I'd like to hand over now to Sister Annette, who will, Annette Danville, um, who will take us into the first session. Hello? You're all set to go. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, happy Sabbath. So, um, as you know, I'm a registered nurse at St. Vincent Hospital. I've been there for a while. Um, and I work in a critical care unit. So, we see a lot of I see a lot of stuff, um, a lot of people that are really, really sick. So when this um, pandemic started back in March, um, no one really knew what it was. Um, we didn't know how to treat it. And so there was a lot of questions that we didn't have answers for. So um, when the first patients started coming in, I mean, they were really, really sick. Um, and they needed a lot of oxygen, needed to be intubated. So they need to have a breathing tube put in, you know, put in their throat and their airways just to help them breathe. And so we saw a lot of that. Um, I was very overwhelmed and still is overwhelmed to see how sick these patients are. And it seems to be mostly men, 40s, 50s, a little bit older men, um, some women, but seem mostly men. And each one has some health issues, some comorbidity, some underlying hypertension, diabetes, maybe some cardiac issues. Those are the ones that we're getting that are really, really sick. But um, Sister, Annette, Sister Annette, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that the session is being recorded. So if you would not like to be recorded, uh, you have the option to disconnect from the session. Okay. Okay. So, um, Yes, yeah, so like I said, they were, they're coming in, they were coming in really, really sick. We weren't sure what to do, what it was, but we know they needed to be intubated. Um, and initially when the patient comes in with COVID, it starts at home, not feeling well, feeling short of breath. So they come to emergency room and then if they're not really bad initially, they'll go to the regular floor, like a med surge floor. But then very quickly, they require a lot of oxygen and need to come to the critical care unit where I work. And once they get to me, it's not very good. The outcome is not very good once they get to my unit. Um, and so from March until about maybe August, we were losing two or three people every day. They were just dying, whether we intubated them or not, they were just dying. Loved ones were calling, checking on their family member, and we didn't, could, we didn't know what to tell them if they're gonna make it or not make it. And most times they, they don't make it. And the ones that do make it eventually go home and die because um, they're so sick. And so it's a typical day for me. Patient comes in, can't breathe. You know, we're giving that remdesivir, we're giving the decadron, we're intubating. Um, and there really isn't a whole lot else that we can do. Sometimes patients are being put in the prone position where they have to lay on their abdomen just so their lungs can breathe and expand. Um, and that really seems to help, especially with oxygenation, um, because it de deteriorates so quickly. Um, 
And so that was for about August, from March to August. And then we had a brief period, maybe three weeks, where we had like no COVID. It was great. We thought we're turning the corner. Um, to not have to put on a mask, a shield, a gown, gloves, trying to protect ourselves. Not sure if we're going to get the disease ourselves or not. Um, trying to stay safe, washing our hands. And so, you know, we'd all leave and go home and just take a, a deep breath, a sigh, hoping not to bring it home to our families. And so for a while, it was for a good two, three weeks, we had no COVID patients and it was great. And then by October, mid-October, we started again. And after Thanksgiving, it got worse. And now after Christmas, it's even much worse. To me, it's much worse than March because in my unit, it's a 12 bed unit and we have 10 out of 12 COVID patients. And even back in March, the most COVID we've had is about eight and now we have 10 and they're very sick. I mean, my last patient, we lost him several times yesterday. We, we literally lost him and brought him back. And he's on the ventilator, not doing well, not responding. He's got what we call the COVID feet where his feet are turning black. He's on sedation. He's on, um, we're calling the family. What do you want us to do? We don't think he's gonna make it. And, and only at that point are we allowing families to come in. Only when they're at that point where we think we're gonna lose them that we allow families to come in. We don't allow, allow anyone to even come in to see their families. You know, we do the iPad where they can see them and those that can speak, speak to them. Now I had another patient last week. He was there for three weeks, um, Vietnamese. He's not sure how he got COVID. He think he got it from work. And we're on the verge of intubating him. Every day we we're gonna intubate him. But he was so motivated with getting better that anytime he felt like he was losing his oxygen, he would lay on his abdomen, what we call the prone position. And I'm so excited that I had a few days off, I went back to work, and he was actually able to leave and go to the regular floor, which I can't even, it was so ecstatic to see that. So we do have like a couple, I call miracle stories, but it's, it's not, that's just not the norm. The norm is we lose them and we're losing them rapidly. Um, they're just, we don't know what else to do. Um, families are calling. Are they going to get better? We're not sure what to tell them. We tell them they're very sick. How did they get COVID? They're not even sure. You know, my elderly lady, she's 83 years old. How did she get COVID? Her son doesn't know. She doesn't go out. She doesn't go shopping. So we're telling the families, you need to get tested because you probably have COVID and don't even know it. And you probably gave it to your mom. And, and now she's very sick. She's 83, she has all the health issues. We're not sure she's gonna make it. And so it's very important for us to follow the guidelines, wash your hands, wear your mask, keep your distance. If you don't have to go out, don't go out. If you can stay home as much as possible, stay home. Because when you get to my unit, you're very sick and you're probably not going to make it. Um, it's really sad to see how sick people are right now and how busy. I mean, we're overwhelmed, we're overstressed, and we, we work tirelessly. I mean, I was at work till quarter of eight. I just can't get out, can't leave because everyone is so sick. And we're just struggling to just, as a staff, as a unit, just trying to being there for the patient and working short staff at times, not having the help because every people are outstretched. And so it's very vital that we take of ourselves and take of our loved ones. And, um, and now with the vaccine, I know everybody has their own ideas, their own thoughts about the vaccine, whether they should take it or not take it. But for us, it's a welcome, New, it's welcome news to have this vaccine because we have nothing else right now, really. And so the vaccine, it's an emergency authorization use vaccine, but it's what we have. And so 
I would encourage everyone to really think hard if you're able to get the vaccine because it's going to help, I believe, to save lives. And so um, at this point, you know, healthcare workers are being vaccinated and hopefully it's going to get out to the community. But in the meantime, wash our hands, keep our distance, take care of ourselves and take care of our loved ones because God wants to take care of ourselves. And he wants us to use our common sense to really think about our health, spiritual health, mental health, and physical health. You know, if we need the medication and it's there, we should really think hard about taking that medicine, whether it's a pill or a vaccine, just like polio and other vaccines in the past. You know, we, go, we get our kids vaccinated from different things. And so this is one more thing that I think we need to be vaccinated against because we have no other remedy coming down the pipeline right now, except the vaccine. And I know it's it's an emergency, like I said, and I know people have different thoughts and ideas about the vaccine, but just watching people die every day and having difficulty dealing with that. And, you know, we have, it's really sad to see. And people's family members not knowing how did my mother or dad get this virus, not sure how they got it, they didn't go out. So clearly they're bringing, bringing it home from outside to their loved ones and they're not getting better and we don't have any other treatments. And so, um, yeah, that's my experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Annette. Um, I, I just want to uh, break the ice a little bit with one question. Could you talk a little bit about the emotional and mental toll that this is taking on you and other um, front, frontline workers like yourself, and how can we be of assistance to you? Okay. Um, so, you know, from the moment we walk in, it's, um, I work a 12 hour shift, so it's a long shift. Um, just, just going in, and having to wear a mat, the N95, a shield, gum, gloves, the whole works, um, a head wrap. It's it's tiring, it's cumbersome, it's it's a, just just be able to put that on. You know, when it, when a patient needs something right away and you can't go in there because you have to get dressed, you know, or when a patient's oxygen is dropping, or if it's the patient becomes confused and take their oxygen off, you have to go in there quickly and you have to make that split decision. Wait, I can't just go in there. I need to put on my gown, my gloves, my mask, my shield, my head and, and go in there and they're deteriorating quickly. And so it's very emotional for us. You know, we try to support each other, but it's so emotional for us to be able to support the patient as quickly as possible. And what we do now is we go, we just go from room to room to room without even changing our clothing. Actually, we go from room to room to room with the same clothing because they all have COVID. And so we go in there and sometimes we have to come out undressed just to catch our breath and take a break and say, I need five minutes and go in the break room and, uh, you know, and just, <laughs> but it's very difficult. So I would encourage everyone to take this seriously because people are dying. They have COVID, they're very sick. And like I said, they don't get well. And so please, please wear a mask. You can wear a cloth mask, that helps. You can wear, a, you know, a regular surgical mask, which is better. And an N95 is the, the best, but you don't have to wear an N95, just a regular surgical mask, a cloth mask that works just as well. Um, and so please, please follow the guidelines. Please wash your hands, keep your distance. Don't invite people to your home that you don't live with. Please don't do that. It's tempting. Please don't do that. Um, and, and keep our distance. And if you protect ourselves and protect each other, we can get through this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I believe we have um, exhausted your section for now, but let us remember that if we have questions for uh, Sister Annette, 
we have at the end that question and answer period that uh, you'd be able to participate in. We thank you for all that you are doing on the front lines, uh, sis. And there are a couple of questions that were in the chat. I think I'll just uh, do one of them. And I think it was, someone was asking if you have already taken your uh, vaccine. <laughs> vaccine. I believe that was the, the question that was asked there. Okay, so um, my hospital received about 900 of the Pfizer vaccine, and then we just got the Moderna vaccine. So they're going in different tiers. So I'm next in line. So I'm going this week to get my vaccine. Um, they started, we started vaccinating at the end of December, maybe two weeks ago, they started vaccinating the front lines, like the emergency room, the critical care ICU, um, so the doctors. So yes, yeah, so I'm next in line. So I'm going next week to get mine, actually, the first shot. Okay. And, you know, I was hoping my kids could get it, but they're not the front line, so. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think that is a good uh, segue uh, into our next presenter. Uh, Dr. Webley, uh, we're going to have a half an hour with Dr. Webley and uh, will be presenting to us the COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Dr. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, being with you again. Um, thank you to uh, Elder Polonies and the rest of you for inviting me. Thank you to Bensi, who is a great advocate. I think you're you're a very lucky church uh, to have the level of expertise. Um, as I listen to uh, Nurse Danville, um, I, I I I thank you so much for the work that you do. Truly, people say these frontline workers are heroes, but you truly are. And I looked at your son as he introduced you, and I couldn't help but think: every day you go in, and you're coming back out, and you're coming home, and you're hoping and praying that you don't take something home to give to your children. It's, it's just a really, really uh, uh, tough thing that you do. Um, and I thank you for that. Um, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. And so I believe that everybody can learn. Uh, I'm just fearless that way. And so I'm going to walk you through a little bit of biology to understand about this vaccine uh, that Nurse Danville just talked about and that um, uh, Dr. Polonis will um, uh, talk about um, in more general terms um, in the next segment. But I believe that we can understand and I believe without information, we are prone to believing things that are not true. Um, and that becomes dangerous. And so my goal this evening is to teach you about how these vaccines are made, the biology behind it, and you don't have to get everything, but I believe if you get even some of this, that you'll be in a position to understand what this is about. And that understanding will bring you to a place where you're able to make an informed decision about vaccination. My, my, my disclaimer is I'm not here telling you to take a vaccine when it's your turn or not. That's not my goal. My goal is to give you relevant and truthful information from a biological scientific um, uh, perspective and then have you make that decision for yourself. Okay, so um, pandemics have been with us for a long time and they will continue to be with us. I just threw this map up because when I teach infectious disease to my students, I typically pop something like this up and say, look at, look at what we've had. So this is in, in, in 2018, the WHO, the World Health Organization re released a list of 10 diseases that can cause epidemics and or pandemics. If it can cause an epidemic, there's a possibility of causing a pandemic if it gets beyond those borders. And so among them were Zika and Ebola, you know, your typical ones, lots of fever and stuff that you see on there that people are afraid of. But also, if you look on there, you see that there is SARS, the original SARS uh, virus, and then that was in 2018. And you see MERS popped up because that was uh, another coronavirus disease that we had in 2012. 
And of course you have chikungunya and, and your H1N1 flu. But then they, they, they went down to the summary and they had a disease that they call disease X. And the description of their disease X is that this is a disease that could cause not just a pandemic or an epidemic, but a devastating one um, worldwide that would put our economy and everything that we do in jeopardy. And many believe that the current pandemic, COVID-19, is disease X. And as I was thinking about this, I was listening to a physician and an epidemiologist this week, and he said, I don't think that this is, is disease X. If we're not prepared, and if we don't learn our lessons from this pandemic, disease X will be much worse because it could be something that's way more deadly. He said, this virus is contagious, but not as deadly as even its cousins, um, MERS and, and the original SARS. So the WHO has as a part of its public health announcement that the two public health interventions that have had the greatest impact on the world's health are clean water and vaccines. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Clean water has revolutionized the world as we know it. The ability to wash your hands, to have running water has relieved us of diseases like cholera and uh, uh, salmonella and some of these diseases that just cause a lot of death and destruction. So vaccines have been this bane of hope. There have been these things that we've used for years. In fact, when vaccines came about, we didn't even know how they worked. They just knew that they worked, right? And so they have been around for a very, very long time and have worked consistently. And what I'm showing you, I don't expect you to read off this, but what I'm showing you here, all, all of these large circles that you see my pointer on represent about 700,000 people. So these large circles are showing you that in these periods, you're having tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people becoming infected and dying from these specific diseases. You know, everything from measles to mumps to polio, afflicting tons of people. And then the orange circle is when a vaccine came about. And what you can see consistently, starting from mumps down to hepatitis, the moment you have this orange circle, the circles got smaller and the smaller circle is like 2000 people. So you went from hundreds of thousands of people becoming infected and affected by disease, these diseases to hundreds or thousands of people just because of these vaccines. And just to bring the point home, these are two boys who were exposed to smallpox on the same day by the same source. The only difference is that one of them, the one on your right, their, his parents decided that they would vaccinate him. The second, the one on your left was not vaccinated. You can see the difference. The postules and the disfiguration caused by smallpox is very clear in the unvaccinated kid. So I guess the point that I'm making is vaccines work. Every data point that we've ever had tells us this unequivocally. So we knew about coronaviruses. We've known about them for quite a while. In the 1960s, they um, discovered um, the, the first coronavirus, 229E, at the University of Chicago. Um, some researchers um, uh, saw it and, and realized that it was among the cold viruses that we typically get. And so this OC43, HKU1, ML63, these are all coronaviruses that we've known about for a long time that have caused the common cold without any problems at all. And then in 2002, 2003, there was an outbreak of SARS-CoV-1. And this was the original SARS virus that led to the death of uh, just under 800 people, infecting about 8,000 people. So that's a 10% mortality rate. And then it just went away. They started trying to develop vaccines against it. But if the, if the, if the pandemic is gone, you can't really test your vaccines. And that's important to remember. And then we kind of forgot that it was around this, except for infectious disease, people who continued to try to study this and look to see what else we could learn. And then in 2012, we had an outbreak of MERS, the little Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, another coronavirus. And it confirmed in the minds of scientists who had long thought that this is something that's just on the cusp of waiting to have another outbreak. 
Here we had another outbreak of coronaviruses, very similar, except that this one has a 30% mortality rate. The good news um, for most of the world is that it hasn't been spreading from person to person. It's been spreading from camels to humans. And as a result of that, it's been relegated to uh, and confined to the Arabian Peninsula. What these viruses, all of these coronaviruses have in common is that they seem to originate and have as a natural host rodents and bats, that they get transferred from bats, rodents, to an intermediate host. Typically, it's you know some animal that we interact with as humans. In the case of, of SARS in 2003, it was a civet cat. Uh, MERS, as I told you, is, the, is a camel. You have some that come through pigs and cows and other animals and that get transferred to humans. And so then came COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. And people have speculated about the origin of it, but what it is clear is that its origin is definitely a bat. The intermediate host, we don't know about, um, but based on sequence homology, based on what we see from its genetics, it is very closely related to a coronavirus that we see in pangolins. And pangolins is, a, is, a, is an animal that is, is, is filled with scales. The scales are used in China uh, for several rituals. So it's, it's highly desired. People catch them all the time. They sell the scales and then they eat the meat. Um, they sell the meat in Chinese wet markets. And the thought is that somehow the, uh, the pangolin came in contact with a bat coronavirus, that there is some amalgamation. That's how you get new viruses formed. Uh, this hybrid of two viruses in one host and somehow gain the capacity to be transmitted to humans because the humans are in both in contact with the bats and with the pangolins. And then it started being transferred around the world. And your elder did a really good job of bringing home just the length and breadth of this pandemic. So far, we have over 84 million people worldwide who have been infected with this virus. Lots of people have been have died in the, in the United States alone, over 340 million people have died. But many people have not really seen um, uh, what this virus looks like. This is a cell. And the, the researchers didn't say what type of cell it was. Um, but essentially what you're seeing is a cell in green and all of these little orange like um, um, dots on it looking like sand grains is your SARS-CoV-2. This is your coronavirus um, that is causing COVID-19. And you can see that it has infected the cell and you, it can um, destroy the cell. The cell actually have these little blebs on it because it's actually dying. And that's essentially what happened. So you would have seen um, some of the images that are put out there of this virus. They're static. They look like, you know, they are, um, it's a 2D um, uh, image. But what you have to realize is that these viruses, you have to think about them as in 3D. So it's not static at all. Their membranes are fluid. They're moving. All living systems that have a membrane have a fluid membrane. The second important thing to note are these projections that they have on their surface, and that's how they got their name. They look like a crown on the microscope when you look at them. So these are what we call the spike proteins. And the spike proteins, this is a stick figure of your spike protein. And this is what kind of sticks out and what the virus uses to bind to our cells in order to get in. So it binds to what is called the ACE2 receptor. This is a receptor that we have, a protein that we have in our body that is used to maintain blood pressure. And it just so happens that this virus is able to bind to this receptor and that's how it gains entry. So this spike protein that you're seeing on the surface and that you're seeing here is actually the key that unlocks the door of your cells to lead to the infection that I just showed you in the previous slide of this virus. I hope you're with me so far. That this virus is this entity, really tiny, and it is able to gain entry into our bodies through these cells. So here's an animation. Here is your coronavirus. It has those spike proteins. When people who have it talk or cough or sneeze, it's in the environment, in the air. You breathe it in, it gets into the lungs and the lung cells are loaded with these ACE2 receptors, these proteins that the body needs to maintain blood pressure and probably has several other functions um, in the body. And what it does is that it uses this red spike protein bind to this receptor. That's the, the key. The red protein is the key that helps it to unlock the cells. And then it gets 
an opportunity to send its RNA. This is its nucleic acid. This is the information that make new viruses and make the viral proteins. It sends that into the cell and it gets replicated. So you have more copies of it. And it also gets read so that the proteins that it needs to make new viral particles get made. And this is this, it uses the cellular machinery to do that. It's called a ribosome. So this is a factory in the cytoplasm of your cell that is able to make copies of this new virus. So that the virus can now get into the circulation, get into the lungs. And so that when this individual who is newly infected coughs or even speaks, these viral particles can get transmitted into the environment and infect new people. And that is why the message that you just got um, from Nurse Vet Danville, that you should wash your hands and social distance and wear your mask is so very important uh, because that can do what the vaccine can't do. It can prevent the virus from getting in your system. Again, I want to, to um, put in your mind this idea of this fluidic membrane that the cell, that the virus has. So this is like a cutaway of a part of the membrane of the virus. And here are these spike proteins. You can see four of them in different colors here. And these again are the keys that the virus uses to unlock the cell to get in. You might have heard about the mutations that you're having in this, in this, in, in this virus and the new mutation, um, the, the, the variant strain in, in the UK called B.1.1.7, not a very impressive name, but essentially um, this animation was put together uh, by Dr. Eric Martz, one of my former professors of immunology. And these black dots that you're seeing, wherever you see these black dots is where a mutation happened in an amino acid that this virus has. The purple that you're seeing here, this purple area is exactly the area that the key that the virus uses to unlock the cell. So that's what binds directly to the cell. And this site is very important where you're seeing these purple um, balls here. That is what the vaccine targets because the vaccine wants to block that key from opening the door of your cells to get in. And so that's what you're seeing here. And that's very close to where you're having the mutation, but not exactly there. And so that's something that is concerning. We have to take a look at that mutation and ensure that it is not something that's gonna cause greater issues. Now there are tons of vaccines in the pipeline for this infection. Right now, as of um, December 24th, 44 vaccines in phase one trial, um, um, uh, phase of clinical trial, in other words, the first clinical trial in uh, first phase of clinical trial in humans. Phase two has 21, phase three has 18. There are five vaccines with limited use. Um, um, uh, those are in China and, and Russia specifically. Um, and then three approved, um, now four, um, um, uh, specifically for use because the AstraZeneca um, uh, vaccine has been approved for emergency use in the UK. Um, there's one that's approved for emergency use in Russia um, and that has gone to Argentina and some other countries. And of course, two in the United States, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. One vaccine was abandoned um, in Australia because of very specific um, uh, problems that came about in their phase three clinical trials. So. There are many different ways of making vaccines. So your polio vaccine is very different from your MMR vaccine in terms of how it's delivered to the body. Okay, so for your polio vaccine, what they did is that they got the polio virus and they made it attenuated, they inactivated it. And then they give it to you. In other words, they make it so it can't cause polio and just give you the whole virus, right? So that's a whole, inactivated virus vaccine. Very few vaccines today are made that way, although in the pipeline, they do have vaccines like that. And then you have the live attenuated virus like the MMR. It's live, it's gonna, it's gonna uh, replicate inside of you, but it won't cause the disease. So that's how the mumps, measles, and rubella vaccine is made. And then you have vaccines like your influenza vaccine, that all they do, they just take a protein from the different strains of influenza and they inject it in you. And the idea of a vaccine is that you prime the body to respond to something that it has not yet seen, but you want it to respond to in a rapid manner. Why? Because when you get an infection, 
or even when you get one of these vaccines, it is not effective or highly effective before two weeks have passed. Why? Because it takes that much time for what we call the adaptive arm of your immune system to get up to speed. In other words, you don't just start a car and immediately it's at 60 miles an hour as you move off. It takes a while before it gets up there, right? And so essentially what the vaccine does is that it gets the engine of your immune system revved up to that 60 mile an hour before you encounter the real deal so that you can take off running at the time when the, when the, when the, the real bug has come around. But there are other ways of making vaccines. Um, you know, you have, you have the, 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 the um, AstraZeneca vaccine is what we call a, 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 a whole virus vaccine where they actually give a viral vector just the way you, they made the Ebola vaccine in a very similar way. So the one that London, the UK just got approved is basically a virus that you put the coronavirus spike protein gene in and it expresses it in the system. However, the two vaccines that are approved right now are called RNA vaccines. And that's a different ball game altogether. This is very different from what you've seen in many other um, uh, uh, vaccines that we have to date. And in order for you to fully understand this, I wanna teach you a little bit of cellular biology, okay? Don't get scared. You don't have to have known any biology to understand this. But what you need to realize is that the information that your cells need to make proteins is contained in the DNA. Why make proteins? Because proteins are the workhorses in your body. This is what do the jobs in your body that needs to be done. So you need to digest some food. The enzymes are proteins, right? You need to move your muscle. Your muscle is made up of proteins, right? Of course, there's nerves that in, um, uh, get activated that get these protein molecules to slide over each other. So you 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 want to get from the message, from the information to make the proteins to the place where you make the proteins. So you go from DNA, the cells have DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and DNA is the is 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 the alphabet of your genetic system. You have your your genetic alphabet, and it codes for specific proteins, but the DNA lives in the nucleus of your cell. The nucleus, your cell has two compartments. The outer compartment is called the cytoplasm. The inner compartment is called the nucleus. The cell thinks that the DNA is so important that it will not let it out of the nucleus. It keeps it in the nucleus. And so when you need to make a protein, what the cell does is that it makes a copy of that specific gene to make that protein. And it sends that messenger RNA, that ribonucleic acid, out of the, the nucleus into the cytoplasm, which is where you have the factory to make the protein. So the way I like to describe this for my students, let's say that you are going to make a really nice pie or cake and the recipe for this cake can't be found anywhere except in an old recipe book of cakes on reserve in the library. That recipe book is not just filled with, is not just uh, containing your cake or your pie recipe, but it has other recipes in there. That's the entirety of the genetic pool. That's your DNA but it's on, on reserve in the library. And if you have ever gone to the library and taken anything off reserve, you know you only have two hours with it and you can't leave the library with it. So if you want to go and make, a, and, and make a cake from that recipe book, what you would do is that you would go to the library, you'll photocopy the pages that you need, not the entire book, because you're not making every cake in the book. You photocopy just the recipe that you need that, and then you take that photocopy out of the library with you. That would be your messenger RNA, right? And then now you get to your kitchen, you put together that cake, that would be, the cake would be your protein. So you do what is called transcription translation. Transcript is a copy. So the copy is your RNA that leaves the nucleus. Then you translate that message from that copy into your protein and that's called translation, okay? 
So that's basic biology. You go from DNA to RNA to protein, okay? So let me show you something now, an animation um, that kind of will help to explain this. The DNA double helix contains two linear sequences of the letters A, C, G, and T, which carry coded instructions. Transcription of DNA begins with a bundle of factors assembling at the start of a gene to read off the information that will be needed to make a protein. The blue molecule is unzipping the double helix and copying one of the two strands. The yellow chain sneaking out of the top is a close chemical cousin of DNA called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through an intake hole. They are matched to the DNA letter by letter to copy the gene. At this point, the RNA needs to be edited before it can be translated into a protein. This editing process is called splicing, which involves removing the green non-coding regions called introns, leaving only the yellow protein coding exons. Splicing begins with assembly of factors at the intron exon borders, which act as beacons to guide small proteins to form a splicing machine called the spliceosome. The animation is showing this happening in real time. The spliceosome then brings the exons on either side of the intron very close together, ready to be cut. One end of the intron is cut and folded back on itself to join and form a loop. The spliceosome then cuts the RNA to release the loop and join the two exons together. The edited RNA and intron are released and the spliceosome disassembles. This process is repeated for every intron in the RNA. Numerous spliceosomes remove all introns so that the edited RNA contains only exons, which are the complete instructions for the protein. Again, this is happening in real time. When the RNA copy is complete, it snakes out into the outer part of the cell. Then all the components of a molecular factory called the ribosome lock together around the RNA. It translates the genetic information in the RNA into a string of amino acids that will become a protein. Special transfer molecules, the green triangles, bring each amino acid to the ribosome. Inside the ribosome, the RNA is pulled through like a tape. There are different transfer molecules for each of the 20 amino acids shown as small red tips. The code for each amino acid is read off the RNA three letters at a time and matched to three corresponding letters on the transfer molecules. The amino acid is added to the growing protein chain and after a few seconds the protein starts to emerge from the ribosome. Ribosomes can make many proteins, it just depends what genetic message you feed into the RNA. So the last part of that that showed you that protein, that red protein forming, is exactly what these mRNA vaccines do. So with the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, all that they did is that once the gene of the, the virus of the SARS-CoV-2 became known in January, they found the gene that was responsible for making the spike protein. I remember what I said the spike protein is. It's the key that the virus uses to unlock your cells to get in. Why are we so interested in it? Because if we can, if we can block that key, if we can take your key and wrap duct tape around it, then when you try to push it in the door to open the door, then it won't work, right? That's exactly what the immune system would do to the spike proteins of the virus and prevent the virus from coming in. So what these, what these companies did is that they got the, 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 the gene, the, uh, the messenger RNA to make the spike protein. They encapsulated copies of that mRNA, the message, into a lipid nanoparticle. And that's what the vaccine is. They inject that into you, your cells pick that up, read that uh, message, just the way you saw in that last animation, read it, make a protein like that red protein that comes out. And then now the cells, your cells, are actually producing that viral protein, but there's really no virus in your system, just the viral spike protein. And when the body sees those proteins, it realizes that these proteins are foreign. And through a coordinated effort, of the immune cells, including B cells and T cells, you make these Y-shaped proteins called antibodies. And these antibodies now are akin to like that duct tape that I talk about that will bind to these spikes on the surface of the virus 
and actually prevent the virus from now entering your cells. In fact, one of the things that these antibodies, when they bind you, they actually signal to other immune cells to kill this virus. So it's not just preventing it from entering, it's actually killing it. So here's how the mRNA vaccine works. mRNA technology has never been used before in an approved vaccine, but scientists are using it now to combat COVID-19. mRNA, or messenger ribonucleic acid, are snippets of genetic code that tell cells to build proteins. mRNA vaccines take advantage of that protein building process to trigger an immune response and build immunity to SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Instead of using a small dose of live or dead virus like some other vaccines, mRNA vaccines use a tiny piece of the virus's own genetic material. Here's how it works. This is the virus. These are called spike proteins. Scientists have isolated the genetic code for those proteins, a set of instructions that are put into the vaccine so your body knows how to make them. Your immune system won't make an actual virus particle, but it will make copies of the angry red spike protein. In other words, no gray ball, but an angry red spike. Once vaccinated, your body starts making those spike proteins so your immune system will develop antibodies to fight the real thing. SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that are created for COVID-19 will be the first licensed mRNA vaccines ever. Okay, so that, that is, that is the, the, those are the, the vaccines that we have today. That's how they work. And so essentially what happened is that they went ahead and they had to test to see if these actually work. So they did what are called clinical trials. And so essentially they went into phase one clinical trial where they gave a few people this um, vaccine. Turns out that because of the way this is made, it doesn't take half as long as your typical vaccine for like polio or the, the, even the flu vaccine. It's something that can be made very, very quickly because all you need is just a, a, that code and you uh, computerize it and then synthetically make these mRNA copies, and then you put them together, use machinery in the manufacturing process to put them into this nano, these lipid nanoparticles, and you can inject them into a person. This is, this is nothing close to the time that it takes to make a regular vaccine uh, that you would have in any period of time. So they test initially to see if it's safe. That's the most important thing with a vaccine. Is it safe? When you give it to people, what are the top type of responses they have? And so you start with a small amount number of people. And so for these two vaccines, they started with less than 50 people in a phase one clinical trial. If they see that it's when they, once they saw that it was safe, they actually went ahead and made a, 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 a response asking for authorization from the FDA to go into a phase two clinical trial. And when they got it, they had hundreds of people in those trials, again, looking for safety, but also looking for efficacy. Does it actually lead to the production of antibodies? Does it stimulate the immune system? And does it have the potential to offer any protection? And from there, if that looks like it's going well, then they can get now approval to move into phase three. What the current clinical trials did is that they overlapped. So here's the normal process that each of these phases would take about three years. What has happened is that they had overlapping phase. So they were doing phase one and phase twos at the same time. Once they got initial data from the phase one that looked good, they overlapped with phase two. They got approval to do that. And then they overlap and most of these vaccines now have overlapped phase two and phase three in the clinical trials. And so over that period of time, they would be able to see what sort of responses they were getting. And so essentially, here's the data in summary from the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine that they enrolled 43,548 participants um, greater than age 16 years old, and they randomized them. They used a, a third party um, and a computer program that determined who was in the placebo arm getting just saline and who was getting the vaccine. Neither the person getting the, the, the shot nor the doctor or nurse giving it to them actually know what they're getting. It's completely blinded. It's what we call double blind randomized trial. And that's why when people say, oh, you know, my uncle um, think he got COVID um, and then he's been eating garlic 
um, and drinking um, this, this juice that his grandmother in Jamaica or in Haiti told him to use, and it works. Doctors just don't want to acknowledge it. That's not the way things work, because how do you know that that's what helped you to not have symptoms? You have no way of knowing. The only way you can know is to do this randomized, double-blind study in this way, where you have several participants who are getting the substance that your grandma or uncle think work, and the other one's getting not getting it. And then you see what the outcome is, hoping, hope that you're following. And so this is what they did. And so they gave this vaccine emulsion to people, and then they looked to see what would happen. And so essentially what happened in these studies is that they, number one, they saw the vaccine was safe. People had certain symptoms that uh, 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 Dr. Polonis will talk about a little bit. Um, but essentially what they saw is that in the uh, placebo group, the group that didn't get the vaccine, they, in, 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 in the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech uh, study, they had 162 people who had symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, and then in the vaccine arm, they only had eight. And when they looked for severe disease, only one of them in the vaccine arm had severe disease and nine in the placebo group. So essentially, this is how they got to the place where they could say that 95% um, uh, uh, that they have 95% efficacy because you had 170 people in the early parts of this study got exposed to COVID and only eight of them or, or had COVID signs and only eight of them were actually in the vaccine group. That's how we know that this vaccine works. And the same thing for the, the Moderna vaccine. They had about 30,420 uh, people. Half of them were in the placebo group, half of them in the vaccine group. Uh, greater than 18 years old, and they were giving these um, a month apart as opposed to the 21 days apart for um, the, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And what they showed again is that in the placebo arm, they had some side effects. They also had side effects in the, in the uh, vaccine arm. And so essentially the side effects were similar, people having pain, having a little bit of fever and stuff um, um, as a result of it. But then when they looked at the data Again, what the data showed was that the people who had placebo were actually the ones who actually got the disease compared to your vaccine arm. So 185 people in the placebo arm had symptoms of COVID, only 11 in the vaccine group. And when they looked at severe cases, none in the vaccine arm, 30 in the placebo group. That's how they know that these vaccines um, actually work. There's another vaccine, I told you the AstraZeneca vaccine, but this is not an mRNA vaccine. This is actually um, taking a part of that same gene that make the spike protein, but instead of just injecting it into an individual, they actually put it into another virus, a virus that can't cause disease in humans. And then they inject that into an individual, the virus itself will lead to making of that spike protein and that spike protein now induce the similar type of immune response that we saw with the previous vaccines. And so I'm, what I'm gonna do now is that I'm gonna address a few of the things that typically come up when we talk about this. That people say, for example, that this new coronavirus was created and deliberately released by people, by government labs and stuff, not true. You know, we, we know so much genetics. And if, 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 if as a lab or humans make a virus, it's not very hard to figure that it was made by a human. This was certainly not, by, based on all the, 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 the sequencing data. That the vaccine was rushed. That also is a myth that the vaccine was rushed. You might say, well, they developed the vaccine in less than a year. Here are some facts. Number one, they didn't just come up with this idea of making an mRNA vaccine when this outbreak happened. In fact, Moderna is a 10 year old company down in Cambridge. And that's all that Moderna has done since they started. Uh, BioNTech was a little known company in Germany that Pfizer um, uh, partnered with to make this vaccine. They had been doing mRNA vaccine development for years. So in the pipeline right now at Moderna, and BioNTech, they have several vaccines from chikungunya to Zika. They've been tr trying to make vaccines against these things on this platform for a very, very long time. Number two, no period in time have we ever had so much money 
thrown at making a vaccine. Federal money makes a huge difference. And so because so much federal money has been thrown at a vaccine, they were able to overlap phase one and two, phase two and three trials and get emergency um, authorization to do that. No company who has investors would be able to or willing to do that because here's the thing, let's say what, what started happening is that once the vaccines went into phase two clinical trials and looked like they were good, they actually started manufacturing these vaccines millions of doses of them, right? Before they finished their phase three clinical trial. Phase three is what tells you whether or not this should be used. Let's say that one of these vaccines failed in phase three. They would have to throw out every dose of it that they had made. That's millions upon millions upon millions of dollars going down the drain. In fact, for the vaccine that failed in Australia, that's a $1 billion bill, right? So no company would be able to take that on, but they did this now. The third thing is that so many people have gotten infected with COVID that it was very easy to test the vaccine. You see, in a regular epidemic or pandemic, you don't even have one-tenth of the amount of people getting infected. So it would take a much longer time to get results after you have randomized and double-blinded a study. With this, within weeks of vaccinating people, you start seeing people getting infected because the infection is so widespread. So those are the things that allowed this vaccine to be developed so quickly. The other one is that the vaccine edits or changes the DNA. And this is one of the reasons why I spend so much time explaining to you the molecular cell biology dogma, that you come from DNA to RNA, from RNA to protein. What you're getting is an RNA vaccine. RNA doesn't integrate with DNA, it's a copy of a DNA, it's a message to make a protein. So it doesn't go back, it can't go into the nucleus, which is where the, the DNA is, is stored. So the probability of actually having your mRNA vaccine changing your DNA is literally nil, impossible. It's not gonna happen because these two molecules are very different. They're in different compartments of the cell and they don't go back. Number three, number four, that the vaccine causes infertility in women and sterility in men. Again, and, and Dr. Paul Nice will probably talk a little bit about this, what the side effects have been, but to allay your fears, there were, they didn't include pregnant women in the study. However, there were women who got pregnant while they were part of the study. Between getting the, the, the first vaccine dose and the second one, there were people who turned up realizing that they were, part, they were pregnant. And there were people who became pregnant after getting the second dose of the vaccine. So clearly, it is not preventing people from uh, being fertile. And then that the vaccine that caused COVID-19 um, uh, has irreversible side effects. Uh, now, in the Moderna, in the Pfizer vaccine, they've seen a few people, about three people, I think, who came down with Bell's palsy. And there are people who have been spreading this rumor online that this is irreversible. And they have this nurse who is crying and saying that now she's changed forever um, um, because of this. Um, that's not happening. Bell's palsy is, is a reversible condition. Very, very few cases where it's not. And then you have very low numbers. Then the, the sixth thing is that people are saying that if you take stuff like vitamin D that is, and supplements that it can prevent or treat COVID-19. There's nothing right now that we know of that can prevent this infection outside of you wearing a mask and doing exactly what Nurse Danville said, staying away, social distancing, washing your hands. So you can take your vitamin D and your other supplements if they're indicated, because of course, having a stronger immune system is a good thing, but don't do it thinking that somehow it's gonna prevent infection of the virus. Nothing does, it will infect you. And then that COVID-19 was an invented pandemic to cover up 5G. Again, that's a myth. 5G is, a, is, a, is an electromagnetic signal. It's not a biological thing. All that wearing masks will increase the amount of carbon dioxide you breathe in and make you sick. Remember that carbon dioxide is a gas. It can diffuse through even your N95 mask. So wearing your cloth mask and your surgical mask is definitely not gonna do anything where your breathing is concerned. You breathe normal um, through these things. Um, and Finally, the Seventh-day Adventist World Church actually has a statement out. I have the link there. I can throw it in the chat later so you can read it for yourself. 
But it says in part that the Seventh-day Adventist Church places strong emphasis on health and well-being. The Adventist health emphasis is based on biblical revelation, the inspired writing of Ellen G. White, co-founder of the church, and on peer-reviewed scientific literature. As such, we encourage responsible immunization vaccination and have no religious or faith-based reason not to encourage our adherents to responsibly participate in protective and preventive immunization programs. We value the health and safety of the population, which includes the maintenance of herd immunity. We are not the conscience, however, of the individual church member and recognize individual choices. These are exercised by the individual. The choice not to be immunized is not and should not be seen as the dogma nor the doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In other words, do not go to your pastors of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to ask them to write a letter for you so that you won't get vaccinated. The church does not have this type of position um, as an organization. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Webley. That's quite a bit that we need to digest. Um, I know later on, folks will have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, but I wanted to just give an opportunity to ask one of the questions that was out of the chat uh, before we move on to having Dr. Paulinese. So this question said, based on the demographic information about the percentage of participants in trials of the vaccines, should African Americans, which had a very low percentage, be concerned about adverse reactions? There were 9.2% African-Americans in the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech uh, trial and about the similar number in the uh, Moderna uh, vaccine trial. So uh, essentially you had people from all backgrounds, uh, from different age groups, uh, so I don't think African-Americans should be uh, more concerned about the vaccine than any other um, ethnic group um, since there were African-Americans in the vaccine trial itself and also in the development of the vaccine. Uh, thank you. Um, I have one more question. Within the past uh, 50 years that you mentioned, how effective have vaccines been in controlling disease and helping to solve public health issues? Vaccines have been the great equalizer, right? If you're talking about some other drug for certain types of cancers, for example, or even antimicrobials, you have to be, have certain levels of insurance to get them. You have to uh, uh, have a certain amount of money to purchase them vaccines have been made increasingly cheap to be available to the population at large. And as a result of that, through vaccination, we've seen the eradication of smallpox. We've come very close to eradicating other diseases using vaccines, if not for the very strong anti-vaccine movement that has um, taken over the United States, starting in earnest again. There have always been anti-vaccine movements. Uh, we saw this the moment that the first vaccine came about, when Edward Jenner first vaccinated against um, smallpox using the cowpox uh, postule, people started drawing caricatures showing that if you got this vaccine, you'll become a cow. And this was the thing that they spread around at that time. Nobody became a cow, but yet they continued um, to push these anti-vax um, uh, things. And then in, 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 in the late 19... Um, 80s, 1990s, the new anti-vax movement picked up with Dr. Andrew Wakefield spreading rumors that the MMR vaccine could actually lead to autism. And that is what started what has now become this driving force behind uh, the widespread anti-vax movement that we see today. And it has definitely hurt uh, vaccinations. We see measles outbreaks in this country and in other countries of the world because of that. But yet, even with that, uh, well over 80 something to 90% of people still vaccinate. And that has led to the reduction in all of the major infectious diseases that we deal with except HIV AIDS. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Webley. We hope to hear something more um, from you as we when we get down to the question and answer session. There are numerous uh, comments and questions in the chat. I'm going to ask the, the chat moderators to look at those questions and select a few of them that we will ask in that session. Um, thank you very much. This is a very, very interesting subject with a high level of interest and participation. I will now transition to Dr. Bensi. Uh, Dr. Bensi, you're up to continue the presentation. And uh, according to the program, you have uh, half an hour <laughs> to do that. Uh, so over to you, Doc. All right, thank you very much. Let me just share my screen and I can get started. Hi, well, thank you, everyone. I'm um, Dr. Bensi Ludolf Polonese, a member of the Pleasant Street SDA Church. Thank you for sister, to Sister Annette and uh, Professor and Dr. Webley for, this, for these wonderful presentations. And I wanna make a, a point. The point of this forum is to um, share knowledge about the current vaccines, um, what's, being, what's happening in the front line, and in order for you to make an informed decision, uh, it, this is not about pushing vaccine on anyone. So I wanna make that very, very clear. Okay, so first of all, like I said, this presentation is only for information purpose so that you can have the right information to make an informed decision. And I have no financial interest in any of the companies um, that I will mention. Dr. Webley has already spoken to this um, in his uh, previous presentation, but whenever someone takes any vaccine, wh whatever type it is, your uh, body's immune system starts to develop antibodies so that if you were to come into contact with that disease, you will likely not get sick or get mild symptoms. And the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are about the same. The, uh, and again, the vaccine is voluntary. No one is gonna be forced to take it. Um, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines Two vaccines are needed to get the full potential uh, for, for, uh, for its coverage. The uh, Pfizer BioNTech is given a 21 day interval. And based on the studies, it has been shown to prevent severe COVID-19 infection in 95% 95, 95 of the time. The Moderna vaccine is given a 28 day, um, 28 day interval and it's 94.1% eff uh, efficacious. So if you were to get a Pfizer vaccine the first time, you need to get a Pfizer vaccine the second time and the same goes for the Moderna vaccine. Um, at this time, it's not no, fully known how long the immunity will last. We know based on studies, once someone is infected with COVID, they, their body's antibody can last up to 90 days. But as of now, we don't know yet for the vaccine. So more studies are uh, need to be done about this. Um, and again, to speak to the point of um, Sister Annette and Professor Webley, uh, even if, you know, we're not going to be able to beat this virus until we've her uh, reached herd immunity, whether it's through natural infection or getting the vaccine. And that's projected to be sometime in this year, 2021. But it is of utmost important, even if you get the vaccine, to continue to wear your mask, wash your hands, social distance, um, and also very important to take care of our body, to follow the eight laws of health. But it is very, very important to follow the same rules we have been following for the past, since March, to keep us healthy. So before you get this vaccine, they will ask you the following. Do you have any allergies? Do you have a fever? Do you have a bleeding disorder? Or do you take anything that thins out your blood, such as Lovenox and Coumadin um, and heparin and other, and other medications? Are you immunocompromised? Or do you take any medications that affect your immune system? 
Are you pregnant or plan on getting pregnant? Are you breastfeeding or have you received another dose of the uh, COVID-19 vaccine? So who should get this vaccine? So based on the studies, uh, the Pfizer uh, has received emergency use authorization for individuals 16 years and older, and Moderna vaccine for individuals 18 years and older. So if what happens to pregnant women or women while breastfeeding, should they get this vaccine? Like uh, Dr. Webley said, pregnant women were um, not participating in the study. So at this time, there's limited data to that talks about the safety of COVID-19 vaccine during pregnancy or during lactation, but every decision, it, it has to do with risk and benefit. And we must remember, and I'll go over a little bit later in my discussion, some high risk categories, but pregnancy, uh, pregnant women are in those high risk categories if they were to get to contract the COVID-19 vaccine, there's a high probability of getting severe illnesses and needing to be in the ICU. Therefore, the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecology, uh, they are recommending that women, especially who are on the front line, to consider taking the vaccine. So who should not get the vaccine? So if you have history of any severe allergic reaction to any ingredients of the vaccine or to a previous dose of the vaccine, you should not get this. And um, a severe allergic reaction is an anaphylactic reaction. And that typically presents within minutes up to one hour after your body being exposed to an allergen. And, um, and that presents as you know, uh, trouble breathing, a rash all over your body that's called hives, swelling of the throat, low blood pressure, fast heartbeat. And that's the reason after you take this, they, you have to stay there for 15 minutes in case something happens. Um, and another category, if someone currently has COVID infection, you should not take the vaccine. So these are the ingredients of uh, both the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines. You can go on the CDC and FDA website to look this up. Um, it's important to remember that these vaccines do not, pre um, do not have preservative uh, eggs or latex in them. So what are some possible side effects? Um, and I, I, I want to make the point uh, that when, what we call side effects, it's our immune system working for us. They're not necessarily contraindications. Based on both Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, um, they, they showed that most of the side effects were more common after the second dose of the vaccine because your, your body's immune system is working much harder at, at developing those antibodies. In the Pfizer vaccine, those side effects were more common in ages 18 to 55. And in the Moderna vaccine, they were more common in ages 18 to 64. So what are some of the side effects? And this mostly has to do with the site of the injection. So you certainly will have pain at the site where you got the injection, swelling and redness of that arm, uh, muscle joint pain, lymph nodes that are swollen that are closer to the area where you got the vaccine, just as um, swollen lymph nodes under your axilla or in your neck area, feeling fatigue, headache, fever, chills, nausea, and malaise. Um, most of these effects can start one to two days after getting the vaccine, and most of them resolve within two to three days. There's a, a remote chance of getting a severe allergic reaction, and that is why they have you stay there 15 minutes after. And after the fact, you can report any side effects to the vSafe website, um, to the CDC itself. So this is a timeline that I was able to get on the mass.gov um, website about the timeline of vaccine distribution in Massachusetts. So we're currently in phase one. It's being given to clinical and non-clinical healthcare workers who work directly with COVID facing patients. Um, next will be pay, uh, people in rest homes, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, uh, first responders, um, uh, the the uh, gels and shelters, um, et cetera. 
Phase two will be between February and April, and that's gonna be to individuals with two uh, plus comorbidities. Those are the individuals who will more likely end up in the ICU if they have COVID-19 infection. And that list includes pregnancy, cancer, chronic uh, kidney disease, COPD, or other lung diseases, heart conditions such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, immunocompromised state, obesity, severe obesity, sickle cell, smoking, and type two diabetes. Um, and then next in the line will be our, our education system, um, individuals who work in sanitation, public works, adults who are 65 and older. Uh, and then phase three will be more of the general public. And that will, it's projected be, to be between April through June. Um, it, and again, this is voluntary. Once the vaccine is more, is readily available in phase three, you can go to um, you can go to your local pharmacy. You can speak to your doctor. But there will be a website that you can go directly to to find where the closest place you can go for the vaccine, and the vaccine is free. Um, I wanted to touch base on the some special circumstances. Uh, pay, uh, individuals who are immunocompromised, uh, whether it's because of organ transplant or for some other reason or taking a medication that suppresses the immune system. Study, the studies have shown that the body has a decreased immune response because your immune system is already uh, dampened by those medications. What if you've had COVID-19 infection? Should you get this or should you wait to get it? Uh, it's important to know if, if you were infected, you do not need to get antibody testing before or after getting the vaccine. But if you've had the, uh, the COVID-19 infection 90 days or less, it's okay to wait because you have those antibodies that can last from the infection up to 90 days. If you receive COVID-19 convalescent serum or antibody treatment, you should also wait 90 days after that to consider getting the vaccine. Um, there's really no study that looks at, can you get other vaccines while you get the COVID-19 vaccine? But it's probably prudent to wait two weeks before or after to get vaccinations such as the flu or the shingles because they can cause sort of the same body ache and malaise uh, sort of symptoms. So these are uh, my references. My talk was really short. Um, I want to thank you very much for your, um, uh, for your attention. And now we'll open up for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, very grateful to Nurse Danville, Dr. Webley, and Dr. Paulinis for sharing with us about this COVID-19 virus so far. Uh, the purpose of today's uh, program was to give as much information about this virus as possible from a medical, uh, scientific, public health perspective to give anyone who might be considering taking this vaccine, the necessary information for you to make the decision for yourself. There are a number of other aspects of this discussion that we probably would not be able to cover um, in this sitting. Uh, I see there are numerous thoughts and comments in the chat and for sure I know Others um, in the live session have their questions as well. But I would encourage us as much as possible to try to uh, reserve our questions for these areas that these uh, individuals are you know, capable or of answering from a public health, scientific, um, medical, standpoint. All right, so the way we're going to do this uh, question and answer session is that you have the opportunity to ask any 
of the three presenters your questions. If you are on the Zoom and you're with your camera on, you may raise your hand and one of the co-hosts will recognize you and give you the chance to ask your question. If you are putting questions in the chat, I'm asking the chat uh, moderators, Jade and Nathan, to select some of those questions to be asked. And if you're on the phone, please just unmute, say your name, and some one of the co-hosts will recognize you, give you an opportunity to ask your question. Under, um, I feel like it's really important that I say something at this point because, you know, I do a lot of these presentations and it doesn't make sense for me to do them if they're not helping people, right? And I've looked in the chat um, and what has become very clear is that there is some unease here about the direction of the presentation. Uh, it appears that you have very a, a couple of very vocal people who seem to want to take this in a different direction. Let me just address you directly. Um, uh, what you're suggesting that their natural remedies against COVID-19 is false. Um, why do I say that? Because I'm not saying that there are not herbs out there that could uh, uh, mitigate COVID-19. There probably very well is but they have not been found yet. And nobody knows if they would ever be found. And so when you go on a chat in a public forum like this, and what you're spreading is that somehow there is some miracle cure out there for an extremely infectious virus. And that somehow there is some conspiracy to keep that from people. In my opinion, it is being irresponsible. I'm an infectious disease specialist. I've looked down the eyepieces of a microscope into cells being destroyed by infectious microbes, viruses, and bacteria. I'm not just talking about something hypothetically. I'm talking about something that I know, that I work with, that I have to protect myself from. So it's really important that when we have these discussions and when you hear a nurse talk about the distress of the people that she is treating, when you have a doctor here who is constantly worried that when she goes to work, she might bring something home to her husband and her kids. Let's be honest here. Let's be fair. And let's, let's stop pushing these conspiracies about, oh, you know, the, 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 the Bible says that there, there are herbs for the healing of the people. The same Bible that says that is the same Bible that says it's given wisdom that's the same wisdom and training that goes into being a nurse, be going to being a doctor, and goes into being an infectious disease person. The general conference itself has put out this, that you might be interested for those who are quoting Ellen White about the herbs. She herself took the smallpox vaccine. Why? Because it was what was indicated at the time so that she wouldn't die from a very destructive infectious disease. So let's let's stop this type of thing where we come onto these forums and we want to throw a monkey wrench in a meaningful discussion and you're trying to disrupt the balance here. Nobody's trying to disenfranchise you from the conversation you want to have. But let's be fair. Let's be honest. Let's be serious about this thing that kills so many people. If that is your argument, it means nobody should take any medication for any disease if it's not from natural herbs. That is silly and we should stop it. Um, may I say something, Elder Wright? Thank you, Dr. Uh, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Yes. Yes, I, um, <clears throat> and along that vein, I'm very concerned also that there have been people, and you know, we as a Seventh-day Adventist church, um, we preach the gospel, we believe in the signs of the times, the prophecies, etc. In the same article that the Dr. Um, Wedley has cited is on the website, North American Division, where it talks about our history of how we relate to science, peer-based research, and um, how we support, you know, those things that are consistent with proper science and medicine. But there's also this 
tendency not only to push some conspiracy theories that counter the medical science. Look, as Adventists, let's be fair, as he said, we run some of the greatest hospitals in the world. We employ some of the greatest doctors. We train some of the greatest medical specialists. So we are not a people who thrive on this extremism where we are Xing out uh, the blessings of um, medical science. There are important um, benefits to building your immune system of being natural. And our health message <clears throat> emphasized this, what we call the new start, the laws of health. All of these things are important to us maintaining strong immune systems. But it's a different ball game when we are pushing without any evidence whatsoever that we can cure a deadly disease, a pandemic, you mind you, that is racking the world with, with, with natural remedies. Come on, folk, let's be careful here. Another thing, and, and then I'll be quiet. This mark of the beast theory. There are some people pushing, well, if you take the vaccine, it could be um, you know, tied to the mark of the beast. Again, we are Seventh-day Adventists who preach the gospel. We do not support those kinds of uh, hair brain extreme pushings that say, wait a minute, you know, the mark of the beast is uh, going to be now the COVID-19. What's it going to be next? What's it going to be next? We believe, as the Bible teaches, that our allegiance to God, our, our faith in God, our loyalty to God is the basis of what the Bible calls uh, the mark of the beast issue. It has to do with the commandments of God, and in particular, the fourth commandment. We know that. So when people teach that, you know, it can, it's not some physical mark, not some implant of a chip, not some vaccine, that has nothing to do with the Bible and what the Bible teaches. And so I want to encourage our people, those who are here today, maybe visitors and friends, I, as a Seventh-day Adventist, Adventist minister, can tell you, praise God, the mainstream majority of our people do not believe in these um, conspiracies. There are some fringe elements that will push some extremes. And, uh, you know, they're free. It's a, it's a land of freedom, freedom of speech. But be clear, this program today is not here to try to uh, push something like a dog in a fight, having some dog in a fight about whether or not we think you should or should not take the vaccine, but rather to inform you, to educate you, and to help you by the grace of God, to make informed decisions, individual decisions. And I appreciate people who call me, they ask questions, they may text me. Some people have even asked me so far to write a letter, but I'm hoping today that it'll be understood that what I've said to you and what is being said today corroborates what we as a church stands for, that we do not put out a test of faith on the vaccine. We do not put out some, um, you know, conscience issue on the vaccine. We put before you the facts. There, there, there is always risk in anything we do, especially with the development of medicine and drugs, and we all are aware of that. So ultimately, with proper education, proper understanding, we encourage everyone to make their own decision, but let's have an honest, open, and uh, good conversation that is not undercut or torpedoed by efforts to, you know, to impinge motives on our good doctors, uh, doctors Benzi and uh, Dr. Webley, and also a goodness, Sister Annette, and of course, the sponsorship of this program Thank you, of the Pastor. family life and so forth. Thank you. God bless you. Yes, I think we um, have uh, kind of set uh, the expectations. And what I want to do is start with one question that I see here in the chat. And I'm going to direct this to Dr. Webley. This person says, I sincerely want to understand why a vaccine is needed when the recovery rate for COVID-19 is 98%. Thank you, Pastor. 
the question. If even though 98% or close to it of people recover, Elder, you started out by listing the number of people who have died in just your county. So the question is, how many people would be enough that would be acceptable to die? We've already have nearly 360,000 Americans have died from this um, virus, 1.8 something million worldwide. So in essence, we're trying to, in creating a vaccine, the vaccine makers realize that this is the easiest way to reach the most people to prevent infection. Now, here's where the 98% conversation um, kind of go awry. What most people don't realize, they think there are two categories of people who get COVID-19, those who survive and those who die. That's a mistake. The doctors and the nurses, nurse, the doctor and the nurse here who work with patients can tell you that of those surviving groups, an increasing percentage of them are having what we call long COVID. These are individuals who months after surviving COVID-19 have respiratory issues, have heart disease issues. Some people have lost part of their intestines as part of the process to get them to survive. People have brain fog. They can't think clearly anymore. We saw it happen live on TV with Chris Cuomo for months after um, having uh, gotten this, this disease. In other words, the long-term effects and comorbidities that are aligned with having had COVID-19 are not even fully understood at this point in time. So for a disease that kills so many people, even if you're talking about a 90 something percent survival rate, when you think about the population of the United States, three point something million, and you get 98% of that, the 2% of deaths is a lot of people. That's millions of people. You don't want so many people to die from something that you can prevent. The idea of the vaccine is to give us a fighting chance so that we can stop the spread. You see hospitals being overrun. People with other types of conditions are not going into hospitals or hospitals can't accommodate them. There are people in this country who have died from heart disease and from having a heart attack because they haven't been able to get a hospital bed in certain areas. We have to get to a place of normalcy again and a vaccine is the best bet to do it. How do we know that? Because it has worked before. In the 1918 flu pandemic, in other pandemics that we've had, vaccines have brought us to a place where we can overcome them. Thank you, Dr. Webley. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Co-hosts, any questions? I saw this question, um, can I get an antibody test to find out if I possibly contracted COVID without knowing I had it. Yes, there are places that, that are doing antibody tests. The problem with antibody tests is that they're not as accurate as this PCR test for COVID. Antibodies are, are these protein molecules that I talked about, but they're kind of promiscuous. So they're people who could come up positive for COVID when essentially they probably had one of the other coronaviruses if the test is not done properly. So these are some of the challenges we're running with the test. In fact, uh, for one of my lab classes this semester, I had my students use one of the um, antibody tests to run and I had students who had gotten infected with COVID and only one of them came up positive on one of these very popular antibody test platforms. Uh, but there are some, some labs now that a Roche has one, a few other labs have ones that have been um, gotten out uh, emergency use authorization that might be useful in testing for antibodies. But here's the thing though, even if you have antibodies against COVID, um, you should still get vaccinated. As Dr. Uh, Polony said, you can wait 90 days or so, about three months after having been infected, but you should still get vaccinated. And here's why. There is nothing that indicate that everybody who have gotten COVID have a protective level of neutralizing antibodies against the virus. And so you could, you could get in reinfected as other people have, have, have demonstrated. Thank you, doctor. I see Donna Norman has yeah. raised your hand. Yes. Um, I know earlier there was something mentioned about sickle cell. Um, how about the sickle cell trait? It, so, I, I, know, I know it's not the same as sickle cell, but I know the trait um, can also 
you know, have some problems there. Sure, I'll, I'll take that question. So um, that that's not a contraindication to get the vaccine, but it's just something, you know, they would ask you more questions if you have sickle cell, sickle cell trait, um, if you were to go and get the vaccine, but it's not a contraindication. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Oh, hi. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to say um, I, I do appreciate uh, the presentation that was given. It's so much more effective when we hear from people that we that we know and trust. And I, I do appreciate it just as much as I appreciate the ones that are uh, very plant based, such as what the Moors did. We do have to keep an open mind to both and, and get the information. So I do appreciate that. My specific question, though, is you had some studies in regards to the efficient uh, efficacy. Um, and I do understand the importance of control groups. You um, gave numbers for those who took placebo versus not, and those who uh, experienced side effects versus not. But when it came to figuring out who got COVID versus not, what was the control group for that? Did they infect? Did they bring those people in front of other infected people to say for sure that it was, it's, it's, it's uh, to say, wait, let me back up. Did they introduce them to COVID? Uh, on purpose? People on purpose. To in, in order to get that, because if we don't do that, my mindset is then it's just a possibility that these individuals could have uh, been around versus not. So I just want to, can you talk a little bit about that? Because yeah. I want to I understand how that worked. Yeah. Very good question. And I appreciate your sincerity in wanting to know about that. The, the, they didn't purposely um, expose people to COVID because that wouldn't be ethical. And, and, and although people have, could do it with um, specific authorization, it's a last resort. They didn't have to do that in this case because the disease is so rampant. So they just allowed people to go out there and randomly get infected. And the way they knew that they were infected was that they were checking on them all the time. And so these individuals had initial symptoms and then they got a COVID test. They got a PCR test. Um, to confirm that they had COVID. They also did, of course, they're taking blood from these individuals so that they can get the long and short of everything. They're doing antibody tests, specific antibody tests on them. They're looking at all the symptoms. They're doing lung x-rays to see the extent of the disease. So these are individuals who were confirmed to have COVID. Some of them had severe COVID. Others, others um, had mild cases of COVID. So that's how they determined it. They just allowed them to go out and get exposed. Thank you, thank you, Doc. I ha I have. There's another hand raised, but I wanted to go to the chat uh, host to see if there are any questions in the chat that you would like to bring forward. Can I say something? Go ahead, Sister. I mean, Nurse Danville. <laughs> okay. So um, there was something in the chat that I want to address. Okay, this came from Sister Liza Murillo. Um, she said, I'm very disappointed with this presentation. It seems like people are brainwashed. Um, these vaccines are unclean. I'm not injecting the ingredients that aren't made from herbs. I'm not going to violate the eight laws and the health of God. Practice what you preach. Uh, practice what you preach. I'll continue to pray for everyone and I'm logging out. Well, I just want to tell Sister Liza Marilla that I'm very offended and disappointed that she thinks I'm brainwashed because I'm not. I'm here to give a person experience of what it is like to take up a patient who's dying from COVID, that it is real. And there are no herbs that's going to fix it. And also, there are vaccines for just about everything. There's a vaccine for pneumonia. There's a vaccine for shingles, chicken pox. We vaccinate ourselves, vaccinate our children against hepatitis. And we don't go to the doctor and says, I want the vaccine with the herb in it. When you go to the emergency room with severe pain and you don't know where that pain is coming from, you don't ask the doctor for the herbs or for the vaccine with the herbs in it. 
You just want to be pain free, whatever it is, give it to me, doctor. I'm in pain. So let's be real and realistic about what we're saying on this chat. And others are agreeing with her. I'm very disappointed that this is what we're doing. We're here to give information. You make your decision about what's right for you, what's right for your family, that's up to you. But I'm just here as a nurse to give you my experience of what it's like to take care of a dying patient every day. So please, people. Thank you. I also, I also wanted to say something, if I may. Um, thank you, uh, Nurse Denville, for bringing this important information. As frontline workers, we put ourselves on the front line, um, being selfless to take care of patients, anyone who comes our way. We're not preferential at who we treat uh, because the, the, what we say is first to no harm. Um, yes, we don't know about everything that's in everything, but as a physician, and I believe when you're in nursing school, when you take your oath, is first to no harm. So I, I take this with great pride um, to do my work to the best that I can. And yes, we have to practice the eight laws of health to take care of our patients. Because when someone comes to me with a health problem, the first thing I ask them to do is, you know, drink more water, eat less salt, get exercise, get sunshine. But if someone comes to me with a hemoglobin A1C of 15, I'm not gonna say go home and drink water because that's doing harm to the person. Um, there are life-saving medications, life-saving vaccines that have been proven over and over to help us. But yes, we must take care of our body because when we don't, our body breaks down. So that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, and you know, um, Elder, one of the things that are that several um, people who I have talked with fail to recognize is that there is a difference between chronic diseases and acute diseases, right? If you have a, a chronic disease like diabetes, you might decide that you're going to change your diet so you can reduce the amount of insulin that you're taking or so that you can just take metformin or something like that and not take insulin. That's a legitimate thing that any doctor will, 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 will work with you to do. But when you have a disease that is an acute disease, like infections, infectious diseases like these are acute diseases. In other words, you have a, a small window of time that it either resolves or it gets worse. And Nurse, Nurse Danville has, has told you about that. Most of the patients who actually end up in her unit don't recover from this thing, they die, right? Because once you reach that stage, that acute disease has to be treated in a short period of time, otherwise that patient will not survive. So when you have an acute disease and you can push herbs and whatever else you want, because there's some people who just believe really fully that there is an herb for everything. I'm not gonna go against that. But show me the herb and show me the data. Show me the phase one, phase two clinical data. Show me the FDA approved study that has shown that this herb works. And show me that scientific data that backs it up. And I will support you from now until the end of eternity. That is what I do in my work every day. I can't just go around throwing around stuff and saying that something works or something doesn't work based on just anecdotal data, because you might have known somebody who did it and survived. How do you know that it was the herb and not the fresh air outside? How do you know that it was the herb and not the burger you had? You know, you don't know that. And that is why you do these very well controlled studies. I'm not here telling you that vaccines are 100% safe. No medicine is, not even the herbs. There are herbs that kill animals and people all the time. You have to know what to eat and what not to eat. So let's not get this twisted. But what you have to realize is that you cannot go telling people, you're not a physician, you haven't seen data that supports it. Please people, do not go around prescribing medications for people when you're not qualified to do so. In fact, it's against the law to do so 
and you could cause the death of people with these types of advice. Please don't do it. And don't do it under the auspices of being a Seventh-day Adventist and following God's law, because what you'll do, as the General Conference put out, is that you will hinder the gospel. Thank you. Uh, Thank me, you, Doc. Thank you. All right, let me ask you a quick thing, uh, Elder. Um, and I think it's necessary to mention it. <clears throat> I think Sister Danville was responding to the idea of the unclean aspect that some people feel, you know, we believe that, you know, we shouldn't eat unclean foods. And there is some concern that some of the vaccines are developed out of things that could be considered, you know, quote unquote unclean. But it's very important to understand the general conference in that article, in that statement that was quoted in its preambles addressed that same issue that scientific research developed vaccines that are used for medicinal purposes are not the same as the biblical um, prohibition against eating unclean foods. So we need to be very clear. We cannot equate the two uh, and draw the conclusion uh, that the vaccine therefore is dangerous and I'm injecting into myself something is unclean. The, the church, our official organ, our leaders have addressed that and made it clear that we as a people must see, must know the difference and that will help us in our understanding and our decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Brother Scott has had his hand up for a long time. He's been very patient. Gonna let you ask your question, bro, Scott. Hey, the question I have is, um, you know, it was brought up that some people um, have stayed home, some older people have stayed home, and the family members said, I don't know how she got the virus, she never got out the house. Um, so it makes me wonder um, how, you know, when you go to the hospital, you see them with face shields on, right? But when we walk around, we're told to wear a mask and no one's wearing a face shield. Um, and how, how, easily does this virus stick to your clothing and you can bring it and it jumps off your clothing and onto somebody else like an older who gets sick. You know, I mean, have we actually looked at that type of thing? Is there anyone who would like to address that from the panel? Oh, so there's, there's no indication that this virus, you know, it, that this virus doesn't move around on its own. When it's transmitted, it's transmitted in, in, in droplets, in respiratory droplets. In other words, you have these larger droplets that you could probably see, but then you have micro droplets. And the only time we're able to see micro droplets is in that when it's cold in the winter and we breathe and you can see your breath, those are micro droplets. Those are small uh, respiratory droplets that have left your uh, respiratory system, your mouth, your nose, and you're actually seeing them as they encounter the colder air outside. So there's nothing that's, that shows, in fact, initially we thought you could very easily get it off surfaces and stuff. The data has shown that the vast majority of people who have gotten it, have gotten it through direct interaction or being in a room with somebody who has it. So you could get it at the grocery store, you could get it at other places that, that we are going to, um, I doubt it very much that you're having it from somebody's clothing, especially if you're washing your hands. Now, here's the thing. The face shield is worn because if you're in close proximity working with patients, it's an extra layer of protection for healthcare workers. I taught over this semester face-to-face -face classes and, and both me and all of my students had to wear both the mask and the face shield because we felt that it added an extra layer of protection from the, especially those larger respiratory droplets. So less of those actually make it to the mask, which as you probably know, is not impervious to the virus just by itself. And um, again, the for the um, eye protection as well, because the virus can infect your oral mucosa and your nasal mucosa and your the, muco the lining of your eyes. So that's why we must wear these, these um, different equipment. And I, I wanted to also add um, people not knowing where they get infected. And the reason I believe we're seeing such a rise, especially throughout the holidays, we are expanding our bottles. So we used to go to work, go to the food store, be very cautious and come home. But now we're saying, okay, I'm gonna go see this cousin. I'm gonna go see this aunt. I'm gonna see this uncle. And you don't know who um, these individuals have been in contact with. 
that's the reason that we're having the search. So I implore you, please, please, please keep your bubbles as small as you can. If the person does not live in your household, you should rethink about going to see them. And another point about traveling and taking a test a day later is just, it makes no sense to me. It makes absolutely no sense to me because those same individuals who get the test a week later, they start getting symptoms and they have already infected whoever they came into contact with. So if you must travel for emergency, I implore you to stay home um, and quarantine before you go to the food store, go, go to work or visit other people. Thank you, doc. I see sister, prayer saved my life. <laughs> Forgot. Thanks, Elder. Mr. Bridget, I forgot your name a little bit there. <laughs> okay, you can refer to me as prayer saved my life. It did, it did. Good afternoon. Thank you, Sister Annette, um, Dr. Wibley, um, Sister Bensi. Thank you for your service, for your sacrifice, and for sharing knowledge. I do have a question from Emily. I can answer it myself, but I figure it's best for her to hear it from the expert. Um, before I ask the question, just commentary from my brothers and sisters on the post. I see a lot of questions about what's the ingredients in the, um, the vaccine. And I think there's a lot of questions in the chat that individually we should look up ourselves. I think we should all be held accountable for researching, researching information from notable sources and making sure that you not only take it from the three experts that are on tonight, but you for yourself has done the research you need to make a decision for your family. So I admonish everyone for the questions that are in here that you can literally Google or go to the FDA or go to MassGov or go to Pfizer or Moderna site, go and do the research yourself. Uh, question from Emily, why are the, um, Vaccines not approved for kids. Um, Pfizer is 16, Moderna is 18 and over. Can you guys comment to that? I was answering her, but she wants it from the source. So can you guys share that? Thank you. That's because they weren't a part of the clinical trial. Um, so in the clinical trials for the uh, Moderna vaccine, it tested people from 18 years old up. Um, for the uh, Pfizer vaccine, it was from 16 years up. So they didn't test, they didn't specifically test kids. Now they're actually going ahead and doing that, but that's gonna take a while for them to get the data from that. And until they get that data, they cannot definitively say that it will be safe for children. It's very likely that it is, but again, in a, in a, in a, with, with scientific evidence being the backbone of vaccine development and distribution, it is important that they wait and see that. Thank you, Dr. Wilby. Thank you. Uh, Elton Norman, see your hand is raised. Yes, sir, how are you guys doing? Um, I wanted to say two things. One was I saw today a chart and I, I would like to, um, it's just very brief. I want to read it for the, um, for the group about the incidence of um, allergic reactions comparing the um, this you know current vaccine to other um, vaccines and other um, illnesses so for example it said that uh, over three million people have received the vaccine so far and their anaphylaxis um, estimated to be one in 190 thousand it is said they had about 11 cases in the US but no deaths this is related to this current vaccine but then you compare that to die in a car crash you have 11.2 people die for each 100,000 people in a car crash. And yet nobody is saying they're not gonna drive. Peninsulin anaphylaxis, one in 2,500 to 5,000, um, compared to, for example, in this case, one in 100, 190,000. Now compare this to COVID deaths. COVID deaths for people 60 years and older is one in 58. If you're 40 to 50 years old, it's one in 183. If you're younger than 40, it's one in 10,000. So when we look at these statistics, it's, I'm, I personally prefer to take my chance with the vaccine because if I'm in, the, I'm in that 40 to 50 year old group 
that's one in 58 compared to one in 190,000 with any kind of indication. And there's been no death so far reported from this vaccine. Finally, um, the issue of Bell's palsy, they said there were four cases reported. Three of them were in people that were vaccinated and one was in the placebo group, which means that basically, you know, people get Bell's palsy all the time. And I heard the doctor mention earlier that it's reversible and it's treatable. So, and one last thing is a lot of people talk about, they don't know what's in the vaccine. Well, guess what? Most people don't even know what's in the bag of Doritos and they eat them all the time. That's my comments. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm going to ask Dr. Webley to address the ingredients um, in, in a moment, but I wanted to do a time check with Brother Paulinis to see how much longer we are able to go here. Yes, I was uh, about to ask you the same question as well. Um, I think uh, it's something we should um, ask the audience, see if, you know, get their approval, if we can go, move forward for maybe half, half an hour, please. Okay, that's fine, I believe. Uh, um, if, the, if the guests, the, you know, the doctors and the nurse is okay with that, um, we can do that, and uh, we will be happy to have as many from the audience as possible stay with us. So that will be until six o'clock. Dr. Webley, I have um, a part of my presentation, the side-by-side -side ingredients. Do you want me to pull it up while you talk, or do you have... Um... Exactly right. That's in your presentation. Could you pop that up, um, Dr. Polonis? So... Yeah, put, put it full, full um, view so that people can see that. So um, what you're seeing here are two things that this vaccine has in. It has in the mRNA, both for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. They have this messenger RNA in them that I talked about. And then they have lipids, right? They, have, they, they are encapsulated. You, so you can't inject the messenger RNA by itself. It will get degraded. It will get destroyed. And so in order to ensure that it actually reaches the cytoplasm of the cell that it needs to reach, it's encapsulated into these fat nanoparticles. And so what you're seeing here, all of these different names, your hydroxybutyl and all of these, these are just different types of fats. So it has in lipids and a few salts and a sugar um, in it. This, these vaccines have no preservatives, right? So it has it's sucrose is a sugar, um, your sodium um, uh, phospho, uh, phosphate is a, is a, is a salt, um, your sodium chloride is a salt. And the reason why it has those in is because when it comes to, when the, when, especially for the Pfizer vaccine, when it comes to um, the, the hospital or wherever it's gonna be handed out, all that is in there is the mRNA and the fats. What they have to do is that once they thaw it, they dilute it, they add 0.9% um, uh, 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 saline, that's your normal saline drip that you get in the hospital. Same thing, they add to it to dilute it so that it can be given. That's why it has those last ingredients, the potassium chloride, your uh, monobasic potassium phosphate, your sodium chloride, that's your regular table salt, your dibasic um, sodium phosphate. These are what you use to make um, uh, normal saline. And so that's why those are in there, but it doesn't have any preservatives. And that's one of the reasons why it, it can't be left out for over a certain period of time. That's why the, um, for the Pfizer vaccine, for example, it's kept at ultra low uh, temperatures. Um, and they, they were deliberate in this because they knew that you would have these type of anti-vaccine sentiments. And so, you know, the manufacturers were very thoughtful um, in creating a vaccine uh, that was as safe as they could possibly get. Here, here's the thing, um, no vaccine company wants anybody to get sick or die or have any um, type of illness from their vaccines. It's not good for business, it's not good for the vaccine, it's not good to end a pandemic. So that's why safety is taken under consideration so greatly, even more than efficacy. If we had a vaccine that only protected 50% of people, they would still be given as long as it was safe. But it had, if it had only 50% safety, it would never be given, right? That's the whole idea of a vaccine as a higher standard of safety than any other medication you get. And you can just go and look at any drug for anything. And what you'll hear after it are a ton of side effects 
many of them quite severe. Uh, for vaccines, there are medications, so of course they have side effects. I don't want anybody leaving thinking that any one of us is saying that vaccines are 100% safe. There's no such thing. Um, these things do have um, uh, 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 side effects that they can give, and nobody would have you take one of these if it wasn't necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Um, I didn't see any other raised hands here. Um, I wanted to th therefore go back to the chat moderators. Is there a question in the chat that you would like to bring out? Um, how long does the virus survive without a host? How long does the virus survive without a host? Without, without getting into cells, and especially if the micro droplets that they're in dry up, they'll die in a very short period of time. You know, you're talking about within hours, if they get desiccated, they'll die. And at every period of time, you're having what is called a half-life of these viruses. So half of what you have is deteriorating over time. So they do need a host. The thing is that as human beings, we love to congregate. And so they love that because that's how they get from one person to the next. That's how they ensure that they can be transmitted. You see, viruses don't have brains the way we do. They don't want to kill us. All they want to do is to make more of themselves. But in an effort to do that, they will put in the most robust systems in their genetics that they can, they can muster so that they will get transmitted. They can um, uh, get into a new cell. And that's why this virus has increased its level of contagiousness. Not necessarily its level of deadliness, but its level of contagiousness, that it has mutated its site so it can bind more tightly to the ACE2 receptor because the SARS in 2002, 2003 also bound to the same receptor, but not with even half of the affinity of this new uh, COVID strain. It binds so tightly that it doesn't let go. And those are some of the things it does in order to get transmitted. But it, it, like HIV, you know, these RNA viruses are not very hardy. Uh, they die pretty readily when they're desiccated, when they dry out. Thank you very much. I don't see any other hands raised. So perhaps I could ask a question of my own. Uh, with the vaccines being deployed, we have been told that the targets for vaccination in the country are falling, or the number of vaccinations are falling way below the target. If that is the case, even for those who are willing to take the vaccine, how should we behave in this time prior to the vaccine being able to be rolled out to more people in order to keep ourselves as safe as possible? It may be something you already addressed, but uh, just to reiterate. Um, I I will take this one. We all three of us have said it over and over, um, but it's important to you. The more you hear something, the better it sinks in. So it's about keeping your distance from other individuals, wear your mask, um, keep your bubble small, meaning keep to your household and not expand that, washing your hands um, before you touch your face or before you eat. And I think um, we had a wonderful video shown during one of the um, health nuggets at one point on a Sabbath. So you should really wash your hands, um, sing the happy birthday song. There are other songs, 20 seconds or more to really wash your hands um, really well. Um, and if you're sick, do not go out in public to propagate this virus. So that will, and it's uh, following these simple guidelines will uh, prevent us from getting the vaccine and um, getting the virus and spreading the virus. 
Thank you very much. Uh, and <clears throat> I want to say um, thanks on behalf of the AY. I have a question. Okay. I Please identify um, or go ahead. Who would you like to ask the question to? To any of the presenters. My name is Tina Hood. Um, I guess my question is kind of a two part. One, has any of the presenters actually worked on the current vaccines? Um, and two, are they familiar with the Tuskegee experiments? Because I just have a concern that this thing was created so quickly. Um, I want to know who knows who knows firsthand what's actually in it, who's watched it, who's seen it. I don't know. I, I there's no long-term trials. What makes them feel or think? Or actually, I'd rather I'd rather actual facts them believe that this is safe to take and that there are no long-term effects from this? So I haven't worked with the COVID vaccine. I've worked on vaccines um, for the past 20 something years, uh, but not on COVID vaccines. I'm an immunologist by trade. Um, this is what I do. I'm a microbiologist and immunologist who works with infectious diseases. That's my area of expertise. And so what I've done is that I followed this outbreak from the moment it started in China I followed all the vaccine developments. I've read everything that has been published on them. I have read through both the emergency youth authorization document, as well as the summary document and the publications, the peer reviewed publications on both vaccines in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, there is no scientific reason for me to doubt what is in the vaccine. And yes, I, I know about the Tuskegee syphilis um, experiment and I'm not sure what, um, uh, the link here with, but uh, let me acknowledge. The link has to do with trust. Yeah, it let has me to acknowledge. Do with trust. Yeah, yeah. And let me acknowledge that um, this has been a problem for this country. Um, when you take young black men and you have uh, the federal government, not just the state of Alabama, but the federal government putting them through a trial to see the effects of long term syphilis on human beings. And even when penicillin was made available and treatment was known, they were specifically prevented, actively prevented from yes, getting they had treated. bad blood. Um, leading to infections of their wives, um, leading to ill effects in their children. Uh, this country has a long way to go with en engendering trust um, in different demographics of people, uh, uh, African-Americans, uh, Native Indians, uh, this is this is a problem, and it's a problem with just about everything that we do where medicine is concerned. It has it has lent itself to the disparities in healthcare that we've seen. However, my comfort level with what I know about this vaccine comes from years of being a scientist. I know the rigor of peer review. Everything that I've ever published from my own research group has been peer reviewed. I have served as a peer reviewer. Um, for, for, for over two decades now on several articles, including articles that were published on COVID-19 during this um, pandemic. So in, in other words, the science of making a vaccine and of how a vaccine works is something that is second nature to me. It is something okay, that I, I understand, I understand that. the way I understand making dinner. And so I can't tell you that 100% that nobody will have any long-term effects from this vaccine. I can't do that because we haven't had the vaccine around for long, for that long. I mean, could people um, somehow two years later, three years later, come down with a side effect from getting a vaccine? There is a remote possibility. It could happen. What you have to realize is that people have been taking these vaccines since March of, of, of 2020. See, people don't think about this. The phase one clinical trials for both Moderna and Pfizer started then. So there are people who have gotten these vaccines in their arms for about seven to eight months now. What we know from the um, FDA data. Seven to eight months is not a long time. I know that, but That's let me finish. Years. 
let me finish. Um, so what we know from the FDA data that has been accumulated over 50 to 60 years of doing vaccinations is that the majority, 90 something percent of side effects from a vaccine come within two months after the second dose. And that is why no vaccine was went up from emergency youth authorization before it had reached that time period after the second doses of the vaccines had been given. So to that extent, in my opinion, they've done their due diligence in trying to ensure the safety of the vaccine. And for clearly, if we were in the middle of a terrible pandemic, everybody would wait for as long as you could to figure out if there are, are side effects from, from these vaccines. However, when they've done the statistics and independently looked at the side effects of these vaccines, they're no more than what we see from every other vaccine that we've ever given out. Any vaccine that you put in a person's arm, you will have pain at the injection site, people will have fever. And a lot of the responses that people are having are actually the types of responses that you wanna see. You wanna see fever, you want to hear that people feel a little crappy because that means that the vaccine is working. That's the immune system for you kicking in. For people who are talking about natural, this is what the immune system does. You're having tons of cellular divisions. You're having both your innate and your adaptive immune response going after these proteins that have been made and seen to be foreign in the body. You're having tons of cytokines and chemokines released in the body to enhance that immune response. And that is what ensures that you have these circulating antibodies and these memory B and T cells ready when the um, uh, virus should show itself um, if you encounter it. So nobody can give you 100% assurance of any medication, no matter how long it's being used. Uh, but from what we have seen and from what millions of scientists worldwide have now evaluated, this is a safe product. So doctor. Well, I, I still look at the HPV vaccine and that was a total fiasco. So, and that in wasn't too way, long ago. What, it was a total fiasco. But, because because you, were, you were inoculating all young children against something that is, is first of all, it, not all young children are going to be sexually active. That's not the and, point. And, 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 the, and, the, and the cervical cancer aspect of it, not everyone is susceptible to cervical yeah, cancer. But you don't know who, and there, was so many, there was so many side effects. It didn't make sense. That is absolutely not that. true, my sister. And, and, and the my pharmaceutical sister, companies aren't my even sister, held accountable I cannot, for side effects. I cannot, you allow you, I cannot allow you to say that unchecked. You're absolutely false on that. The side effects were no more for either the Cervivax or the other vaccine that we had in the US. None of them had any side effects beyond what we typically see. Here's the thing with vaccinating. You can't say who is gonna encounter the thing. If it's around, no matter how you try hard, human beings are gonna be human beings. So what you do is that you vaccinate people. That's what the vaccine was created for. And what we've seen is a significant reduction in not just cervical cancer, but genital warts as a result of this. And because your kid might not be having um, sex or unsafe sex to get it, doesn't mean that somebody else's kid is not doing it. And why should somebody else's kid suffer um, for whatever reasons we might conjure up? So again, I think, I think what this falls under, in my opinion, is that you have genuine fears of vaccines and medicines that are created. And that's legitimate. I can see that. I have, I have concerns too, because it, a don't. lot of it is not logical. That's why. It's, it's, I, I disagree with it's you. It is totally logical. What you're doing is that you're allowing your fears to push you in a space where you're now trying to emote these emotions and you're wanting other people to agree with it, but it, 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 we can't. You no, know, I'm, I'm asking you to answer some questions because I have concerns and I have logical questions. I've done a lot of research. I've done a lot of reading. I've, I've read about all the side effects that people are encountering and problems that people are having. And I have concerns. And it just seems to me that, you know, I don't know why, rather than discussing and saying, yeah, there's, there, there's some problems and this was developed quickly, it seems to me that 
this panel is very pro vaccine to the extent that they're not, none of you are really discussing what, what the side effects are, what could be long term side effects. I mean, you're, this vaccine is doing something that other vaccines have never done before. Um, they, it's using the RNA. It was, and you're saying it wasn't developed quickly. To me, it was developed quickly. Um, and that's, and I, there's, there's, there's no long-term side effects. I would like to see somebody taking this. I did not say that. For, for a couple of years. You see, um, my sister, this is what people do that I don't like in these discussions. You're saying something that I did not say. I did not say that they're not long-term side effects. I did not say it's hundred percent safe. I did not say people. No, not I didn't say. Wrong. No, I did not say that. You said that. I said that you're. Yeah, not you said that we're saying there are no long-term side effects. What you want me to say? No, I, I did not. No, I'm not I trying didn't. to go against a vaccine, and I'm also not trying to go against you. What I'm asking you to do is to manage these fears carefully, because when you say this, there are people who are for no, who no doubt have great respect for you. And I do too. I respect the point of view that you have. But what you have to realize is that when you have a pandemic that's killing so many people every single day, there are going to be risky moves. And part of it is creating a vaccine quickly. And this platform that you're saying that we don't know about, yes, you're right. And I'm one, I was one of those people who had concerns about this platform because I didn't fully understand it. Once I got to the place where I understood what it was and what, how it's working, I have more confidence in it. Will there be side effects that we pick up next week, next year, some other time? There, there is a possibility that that is the case. What is the worst thing that could happen? That somebody could die from a vaccine? It's highly unlikely that that will happen. But here's the thing. If I vaccinate 1 million people today for anything, let's say I just inject water into them. You didn't know that that's what you're getting. 1 million people. It is very likely that within the next week, five of those people could die from a car accident. That Would you true. say that the vaccine resulted in them dying from a car accident? It probably didn't. And you could have 10 people or 100 people out of that group dying from a heart attack, depending on the age range. And you might say, oh, maybe the vaccine caused a heart attack. So you see my point? My point is that you cannot attribute things wholesale to vaccination the way a lot of anti-vaxxers do when there's no scientific evidence that links it. You know, in the, in the early 18, uh, late 1800s to early 1900s, they thought that lung cancer was caused because people walked around with matches in their pocket. Why? Because every, almost everybody who came down with lung cancer were known to carry matches. They never linked it to the fact that people carried matches because they were smoking cigarettes. Can I, can I tell you something? So you have to parse if, if, the data. If this vaccine was made out of the actual, the actual COVID and they were injected me with a small amount of COVID or dead COVID, I would take that. I would not have a problem with that. But I don't, I don't like the way that this was made. I, I, you know, you're talking about that they made a copy of it. Like you go into the library and make a copy of a recipe in a book. That that I, I, I'm sorry, I just don't. But do you, I don't understand it. I don't trust it. I'd rather right. get the real thing. You hit the and, nail on and, the head. And I would right rather there. that would that would make more sense to me to actually get the actual COVID, a small amount of it, injected into me, and let my let my immune system go after that. Well, well, that's exactly what the virus does, my dear. No, no, but, but, but you're doing. not giving so me just, the... Just wait up a little. Just wait up a little. I listen to you. I'm trying to explain. Okay. This is exactly what the virus does. The virus injects its RNA into you so that it can make more of itself. All that the scientists have done is that they've used the same principle. That's how we figured out that this could work. The virus does the same thing. So all they did is that in taking, instead of taking all of the virus, because we don't need all of it, you take the part that make this thing that the virus uses to get into the cell, because what you're trying to do is to neutralize it. You can't neutralize it by binding to everything. You neutralize it by binding like to the genetically cells. modified vegetable. That it uses to get. Nothing is modified. You see, that's the thing. People put these things together and you create a narrative about it. All that has happened is that we're doing exactly what the virus does. It injects its, its RNA into the cell. 
what the scientists have done is that they have created a shorter piece of that same RNA and put it in our cells so that we can make the very protein that you're talking about injecting in you from the virus, that it would have to be grown up, somebody would have to put, be put at risk of growing it up, of breaking it down, of purifying it. It would have all the chemicals and traces of those in it. And the anti-vaxxers would complain that they're not taking it because it has all these other things in it. All that has been done is that we have used the factory that your cell already has, that the virus is co-opting to make more of itself, to make a small piece of protein that now becomes the vaccinate. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. I allowed this, this uh, you know, back and forth so that, you know, those of us who may have those concerns could listen as well. Um, we are out of time because I need to hand back over to uh, the leaders from the AY. But I believe that this has been a very important discussion to have this evening. Remember, this was intended to look specifically at the COVID-19 virus. We know that in our country and in our world, we are in the midst of a pandemic that is taking many, many lives. And the scientific community has come up with one tool that is being used to try to attack and de de destroy this pandemic. There, there are many other topics around this that, and other discussions that we can have, but I hope that today's discussion at least clarified for us what this vaccine is all about as much as we can understand. And remember that in our country, we have over 20 million cases of COVID-19, 348,000 deaths. In our state of Massachusetts, 375 thousand cases, 12,000 deaths. And in Worcester County, 42,000 cases, 1,500 deaths. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is like the congregation of our Pleasant Street Church, 10 times over. That's the number of individuals that have died in Worcester County so far. And so, based on what you have heard, what you understand, you, I believe, is better equipped now to make a decision as to what you will do in your own life with regard to the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Webley. Uh, so, Elder, Elder Wright, I know you're making your closing remarks, but I don't know if you want to take a burning hand that I saw in terms of Lindsay. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I didn't see her hand. I'm sorry, uh, Lindsay. We will we will give you that uh, opportunity to ask the question, and then I will just have uh, Brother Paul and his take over from after your your question. Lindsay, I. Uh, Brother Wright, I'm sorry, that was a narrow. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So so I was saying thank you, Dr. Webley, um, for coming to us again. We're always blessed when you come to talk about um, your area of expertise. Thank you, Dr. Paulinese, uh, for being here with us and adding your expertise as well. And for Nurse Danville, we appreciate you taking the time to spend with us this evening. And thank you all for participating. And over to you, Brother Paulinese. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the AY and our Family Life um, Ministries, um, I want to express uh, my great uh, gratitude uh, for having uh, the professionals because uh, not many um, 
places, not many churches. Like we have to be our will about it. Have that opportunity to have a discussion like this with the best, some of the best professionals. So we have to be very, very uh, grateful for you know, how they are able to uh, help us. Like we have uh, Annette with us, like she's taken her time to really come here and then share her wisdom. We have a uh, Professor Webley. He's super busy. He barely has time for anything else, but yet he's able to give us, you know, like a few hours to share his knowledge. We also have a physician, uh, my wife, like they are able to come in here, see how can we have a meaningful discussion? Like how can we equip, like how can we prepare the church for the vaccine? This is for you, nobody else. And I'm hoping today we can learn something. Don't think about uh, the questions, you know, like people are asking, but it's really about you. What have you learned? Are you, do you feel ready and prepared for the next step? And you can thank God for allowing this to happen today. Extremely grateful again for Professor Webley, Dr. Louis Dopalinus, and um, Sister Annette Denville. Thank you. Now we will have um, Sister uh, Vivienne to want close with a prayer. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, doctors Paulinese and Webley and um, Nurse Danville. And thanks for the lively discussion. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're here in your presence. Lord, we're at the end of another Sabbath day. It's the second day and turning to the third day of the new year. And Lord, we're thankful that Family Life and AY have you have impressed them to present this information to us. Lord, I pray that we will take this as, um, as a watermelon. You know, there's the meat and there are the seeds. We can spit out what we don't want and we can eat what we want. Lord, I pray that you will guide and direct our path. You will help us to make the right decisions as to what to do. We know when we you have told us that to trust you with all our hearts and lean not to our own understanding. Acknowledge you in everything and you will direct our path. And so we leave everything in your hands, God, knowing that you will tell us the right thing to do. We know there are those of us who are skeptical about it and there are those of us who are comfortable with it. And we know that everything that we hear, we're not all going to... Um, we, each one of us has different um, opinions about it, but Lord, we need, that's why we need you to direct us because we know that what you tell us is in our best interest. So Father, we depend upon you for guidance and I pray that you will protect our, our medical workers, our for, frontline workers, Lord. And I pray that you will just continue to place your hand upon them and those of us who are suffering from COVID and all other diseases, Lord, I pray that you will grant healing mercies onto them. I ask that your spirit will continue to dwell with them, Lord, and they will just put their faith and trust in you, knowing that you're with them every step of the way. I ask God that as we await your soon coming, you will prepare us for that day when there'll be no more sickness, no more pain, no more dying. Lord, all will be peace forevermore on your happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. Keep us faithful until then, then dear Father, and may it be that we will all, all have a place with you in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I wanted to add one more thing. I want to say a special thank you to Dr. Webley and Sister Annette because we planned this um, in a short amount of time because we thought this was very important for our church community to know and they answered yes without any hesitancy. So thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure.
Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> uh, appreciate your spending the time with us the past three hours and hope it was beneficial to all. All right, thank you all. Thanks for debunking conspiracy information. Is Sister Ania saying something? We can't hear her. Okay, no. Well, it seems like we uh, are not in any hurry to go anywhere. We're meditating on what we just heard here. <laughs> I just uh, wish all of you a very good week. And, uh, well, maybe the folks waiting on Bible study, but you know, we won't start Bible study at, um, at six o'clock. <laughs> okay, so you will play us some music then. Uh, Elder, to take us yeah, up. We can, we can probably try that. <laughs> This is your word that you've been waiting for all night. Darwin, where are you? How many know that God is able to do exceedingly? Abundantly above. All you can ask something. According to the power that worketh in us. Hallelujah. How many believe it tonight? Somebody turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor.